2 Timothy chapter number 3 in God's Word. We're going to move into chapter 3 this morning, so that's exciting. And uh, 2 Timothy 3, if you're using the church Bible under your chair, it's page 1239. That'll take you there to, uh, to our text, 2 Timothy 3. We love to look into the Bible here at Crossroads every Sunday, and we want you to see it. I think it impacts you more if you see it. You can listen. But, uh, but I think it impacts us when we see it. So let's look into God's Word. Um, 2 Timothy 3, when, you are, um, when you're traveling on a trip or a vacation, I love, you know, I'm, I, like, I want to make really good time. I, I just want to get it over with, you know. So some people like to stop a lot. I, I'm the type, my person, I just want to get it. Fortunately, Denise is the same way. We just want to get it done, get where we're going, you know. My mom lives in Missouri. It's about a 16-hour drive. I want to do it in 14 if I can, you know. Um, so that's the, kind of the goal, you know, because you get a time change, an hour, you know, you, you save an hour going there. So, you know, it's like, you know, I want to do it in record time. And when you're traveling on a, on a trip like that, you ever, you ever been making really good time and then all of a sudden one of those flashing signs is on and it says, warning, crash ahead, expect delays. Isn't that exciting? And, of course, then you feel bad because, you know, you're complaining, and then it's like, well, well, I could have been in the crash, right? So you, you like, I need to pray for these people. You know, as a believer, you kind of start feeling like, ah, I shouldn't be this way. And then you look on your phone, you're looking for alternative routes, and, yeah, there's an alternative route. It adds two hours to your trip. Oh, boy, that's exciting, you know. And um, so in, in the text that we're going to look at, basically what the Apostle Paul, who writes this book, what he's saying to his young protege there, Timothy, he basically, that's what he's saying. He's, he's saying, warning, crash ahead. He's saying, Timothy, um, you know, here's what's coming in the future for this world, and it's not good. In fact, look at verse 1. Notice how the chapter opens up. He says, Timothy, you know, this know, this know, know this man, that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Perilous you know, that's not a word we probably use a lot. Trust me, perilous doesn't mean marvelous, okay? Peril means, if you're in peril, that means you're in danger. Um, perilous means dangerous times are coming. Fierce is what the word means. Um, in fact, to give you an idea of what perilous means, it's the same word used in Matthew 8, 28 to describe two men that were demonically oppressed and, and, and demonically, you know, possessed. And, and so it's the same word. Uh, it's not good. You know, he said, in the last days. Now, when he talks about the last days, he basically is saying, Timothy, um, as we move along in this time period, this church age that we're living in, as we get closer to the return of Christ, Hey, man, things are not going to get gradually better, but they're going to digress. And then Paul begins to sort of paint a picture for Timothy of what things are going to look like as, as time moves along and as we get closer to Christ's return. And it's not very pretty, but it's truthful. Look at verse number two. He says, For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful. He says people are going to be unholy. He said they're going to be without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. He says, they're going to have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. So, you know, you look at that, it's like, wow, that is, the, that is a portrait of a train wreck right there, is it not? It's not pretty. And yet, do you all think Paul was right in what he said there, huh? Of course, it's the Bible. We know that, and it's right. But, I mean, it's like, you can read the morning newspaper. It's like, yeah, man, that, that's, that's dead on, you know? And the thing is, you can read a list like that, like we just read, and you can get depressed, or you can decide, hey, you know what? I'm going to heed this warning sign. I'm going to learn from this. I'm going to learn from that. And, and here's the beauty of it. Here's the beauty. Our homes as Christians, as believers, and our relationships and friendships and relationships in the church and all this, 
Our homes and our relationships do not have to follow the path of culture. They don't. We do not have to follow the path of culture. But instead, our relationships can be like a beautiful portrait, a masterpiece that has been painted. It's interesting that when you read lists like this in the Bible, you know, bad stuff lists, usually it lists big, what we think of as big time sins, you know. Usually lists like this, like in Romans 1, has a list of stuff. And uh, usually when you read lists like this, it's got stuff like murder and stealing and extortion and uh, adultery, things like that. This doesn't have any of those. And in fact, you read this, and all of a sudden, it started hitting me as I was studying this. I'm like digging in, you know, I'm studying this out. And I'm like, wow, this stuff deals with things that are more relational. In the context, it's as if the Apostle Paul here seems to be dealing with the breakdown of homes and people and families within the church. Not really so much lost people that he's talking about, although lost people, definitely this stuff would characterize them too. But it's as if he's saying, Timothy, young Timothy, right, who's a young preacher. He's like, Timothy, man, these are the things that you're going to have to deal with as you work in the ministry and as you work with people. And Paul was so right. I mean, as a pastor, that's the stuff that we deal with day in and day out, the the stuff we just read. Um, Counselors, you know, our counseling staff, that's what they deal with on a weekly basis. The things that we're going to look at here on this list, these are the things that lead to the breakdown of marriages and relationships. Yes, in the church. In the church it happens. And, you know, we could sit here and we could study a text like this and we could all sit around and we could all just sit around and moan and groan about how terrible the world's getting. You ever hear people talk like that? The world's just getting worse and worse. Can I submit to you, the world has always been terrible, (laughs) okay? In Noah's day, way back in Genesis 6, the Bible says that every imagination of the thought of man was evil continually, and violence and corruption filled the earth. So, I mean, Satan is, this is his heyday right now. Satan's the prince of this world, Jesus said. The world system in place on this earth was put here by Satan. It's his idea, and Satan is... You know, what do you expect? I mean, he, Satan's the author of chaos. And, and one day Jesus is going to return. Jesus Christ will take dominion over the earth. Satan will be put out of business. But until then, you know, Satan's the prince of this world. This is his world system. And, you know, human nature hasn't changed. You know, it's, it is what it is. And there, there's nothing that we can really do about that. But, but here's the encouraging thing I want to share with you. Here's the encouraging thing. While there's nothing that we can do about Satan's world system, we're not going to reform Satan's world system, and there's nothing we can do about that, but I submit to you there is something that we can do about our own lives and our own homes that we can control. We can be lights in the midst of darkness, Paul said. You can be a light in the midst of culture. You can be a light for Christ in the midst of darkness. And that's what it's all about, right? That's what we just sung about. And so, you know, I, I want to, what I want to do is, is um, I want to look at these things uh, on the list. And of course, we want to understand what they mean. Some of the words we don't use a lot anymore. So we want to, we want to understand it, of course. But then beyond that, I want to see how they, these things can apply to our own lives, our everyday life, our marriages, our friendships, our relationships, our homes, um, you know, as we raise our kids. You know, what, it's like, okay, yeah, this is a list of some really bad stuff, but what can we do to prevent these things from coming into our homes, into our lives? What, what can we do? How can we take these bad things and how can we turn them into something positive? What's the opposite? Because each one of these has an opposite. So what can we do? You know, and I want to just say to you right off the bat that, 
You know, you could approach this text with a doom and gloom. Oh, the world's getting bad. I don't like being around people like that. Do you, you know, people that are like, oh, the world's just getting worse and worse. And I, 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 I you know, it's like, I don't want to be around that. I don't want to hear that. You know, yeah, I know it is. But you know what? I'm here to tell you something today. Our lives do not have to read warning, crash ahead. Our lives can read joy ahead, <laughs> peace ahead, love ahead, healthy relationships ahead. Wouldn't it be great? Somebody comes into the front door of your house and they're coming in and they look above the door and it says, warning, joy ahead. <laughs> Watch out when you enter our house, man. You're going to laugh a lot. Amen. Because we're going to have a good time. You know, and they come in your house, it says, warning, love ahead, <laughs> you know. And, and that's literally what your life can be like. You, listen, you choose how to, how many of you believe that God gave us a free will to make choices? You believe that, amen? We're not robots. We can make choices every day. We do make choices every day. And therefore, we can paint our own portrait of what we want our lives to look like. It doesn't have to look like this list. So we're going to go through them, and we're going to hopefully learn a lot. All right, let's look at the first one. Look at verse number two. It says, uh, okay, so he says perilous times are going to come. Bad times are going to come, Timothy. But then he says in verse two, he, he begins to kind of, you know, give him a portrait of what it's going to look like. Timothy, this is what's going to look like. For men, people are going to be lovers of their own selves. Well, right away, some people are like, well, that's a good thing. You need to love yourself. And look, I understand that if a person hates themselves and if a person can't forgive themselves, that that'll lead to all kinds of issues. And I get that. But humanism and much of modern psychology teaches this. It teaches that everything begins with you and centers around you. Everything begins with you and centers around around you. So they tell you, you must love yourself first and foremost. You live to please yourself. There's a philosophy that says, if it makes you happy, then it must be all right. I hear this a lot. I even hear believers spout this philosophy. You know, some guy will leave his wife and his kids, and, and, and then someone will say, I know he left his wife and kids for another woman, but if it makes him happy, then I guess it's okay. What about the string of bodies he's left by the wayside? What about all the bruised and battered and scarred people he's left by, live, you know, by the wayside? And it's not okay because he's happy, you know? But you hear this. You know, and it's like, wow, you know, and when and when a when a psychiatrist or a, a counselor tells somebody this, well, if it makes you happy, that's the most important thing. Well, what if it makes them happy to slug the psychiatrist? Huh? <laughs> what if it makes them? What if it just pleases them to give you a knuckle sandwich? Huh? It's like, come on, man. Tell people right. You know, and it's it's like. <laughs> It's like a joke I heard about a guy that had an issue. He'd go out with his friend, you know, and they go out to eat, and he, he would do the most bizarre thing. He would take his entire glass of whatever, you know, whether it was soda or tea or water or whatever, and, and it, he would just take the whole glass, and he'd just throw it in the face of his friend. And his friend's like, dude, you got problems, man. What's made you start doing this? You know, we've been friends for years, and he's like, well, you know, and he did it several times, and the guy's like... The guy's like, man, I'm sorry. He said, I, I just, he says, I just have this overwhelming urge to throw that in your face. And he said, and when I do it, it makes me really, really happy. He said, then I feel real guilty and I feel real bad after I do it. And I just feel terrible. The guy's like, man, you got some issues. You really need to go see somebody this week, you know. So he says, okay, I will. So he goes to a psychiatrist that week. And so he calls his friend and says, I did what you said. I saw a psychiatrist and I'm cured. His friend's like, great, let's celebrate. Let's go out and eat tonight. So they go to a restaurant, about midway through the meal, the guy takes his entire glass and just throws it in his friend's face again. His friend's just dripping with stuff all over him. He looks at him, he says, man, he says, I thought you went to a psychiatrist and I thought you were cured. The guy says, I am. He says, I don't feel bad about it anymore. 
If it makes you happy, do it. <laughs> don't feel bad. And that's the philosophy. If it makes you happy, then don't feel guilty. Don't feel bad. Then it must be good, you know. Can I submit to you that is a recipe for relational nightmares? Warning, crash ahead. You know, someone who just thinks they're the center of the universe. And here's the deal. You get two pe- then people get married that are both that way. <laughs> they're both selfish, self-consumed, lovers of their own selves. Get two people living under the same roof that way. Then let's throw in a couple kids later on who think they're the center of the universe. (laughs) Forget about crash ahead, explosion ahead, right? (laughs) So what's the alternative to being a lover of your own self? Well, what did Jesus teach? Look in your handout. Let's see what Jesus taught. All right, it's in your handout there. And it says, Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, he says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So you know what the teaching here is, church? Here it is. You ready? Love the Lord first and foremost. And by the way, you learn to love God just like you learn to love anybody. You didn't just, you weren't, you didn't just wake up one morning, look in the mirror and love, love the person you married. You learned to love them, right? You fell in love with them. And in the same way, as you study about God in the Bible, And as you learn about God, and as you talk to God in prayer, you begin to fall more in love with God. So you you love the Lord. And then what happens is, as you learn to love God, guess what? Now all of a sudden you do have a healthy perspective of yourself. It's not based on humanistic subjective reasoning, but now you have a healthy perspective of yourself that's based on God's view and God's perspective of you. And then you begin to love yourself in a healthy way because you see yourself loved passionately by God. You are loved unconditionally by God. You are forgiven completely in Christ. You are accepted in Christ, secure in Christ, significant in Christ. Now all of a sudden, I'm able to take all that divine love and now I can truly share that with other people and love them. And that's the idea of what Jesus is saying. In your handout, it says that loving God and loving others should be the two main priorities of our lives if we want healthy relationships. And it is. You love the Lord and you love people. That's the basis of healthy relationships. And it's not, if if you want unhealthy relationships, then just love yourself. But if you want healthy relationships, then you love God and you love people. Let's go to the second thing. Number two, he says that uh, people are not only going to be lovers of their own selves, he says, number two, they're going to be covetous. Covetous, what does that mean? Covetous covetous means greedy, okay? It means, it uh, it says that another word for that is greedy and selfish, right? That naturally follows self-love, doesn't it? I mean, people... Uh, And and by the way, if you look up that word covetous, it says that it literally means a lover of money. By the way, what does the Bible say? The love of money is the root of all evil. And, and, And that's what the word means. Covetous means a lover of money. People want money and things that will make themselves happy. Lover of your own self. People become covetous and they want things that will make, that will make themselves feel good and look good. I owe it to myself is the attitude. Well, you see how these two first two things go together, don't you? Lover of your own self, so you're covetous. And a covetous heart is going to sabotage your marriage and your relationships in life. Why? Here's why. Because the very essence of healthy relationships is giving. It's giving. Ephesians 5.25 is in your handout. Great example. Look at that. It says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and what? And gave himself for it. Now, there's two things that Christ does in that verse. Can you all tell me what it is? There's two things it says Christ does. Number one, Christ what? 
loved. Number two, he gave. The very essence of love and healthy relationships is giving. And I'm afraid what happens is too many people today, young people, middle-aged people, senior citizens, they get married really with the attitude they expect to receive. They're looking that I'm going to receive in this marriage. And almost the attitude of that that marriage is going to, that other person's going to fix my problems that I've had all my life. Can I submit to you, marriage doesn't fix anything. Okay? Marriage isn't going to fix you. All right, you're not going to wake up the morning after you're married and look in the mirror and be a different person. You're still going to be you. The core of who you are isn't going to change because you got married. But a lot of people go into marriage thinking it's going to fix them, and it's unrealistic expectations they enter into it, rather than going in with the mentality, I'm going to give. It's no, what can I receive? How can that person fix me? And when you get two, here's the deal though. When you get two people in a marriage, ha, huh, hold on. You get two people who are in the marriage and both of them are living to give to one another, you will have a happy, contented marriage. Not that you're not going to have bad days, but overall, you live to give to your spouse. It's like, man, it's about them, not me. You see, that's why I say these first two go together so well. Instead of loving myself, I love her or him. Therefore, instead of being covetous and it being all about me, I'm going to be giving and generous instead of covetous. See how the first two go together? Make me feel good and act like you see how they go together. Yes, yes, that's a good point. But, you know, if you get two people in a marriage and they're like, you know what, I really want to make sure that I'm meeting my, my husband's needs. I just want to meet his needs. I want to make sure that I am meeting his needs as, as a wife. I'm meet, and the husband's like, I want to meet my wife's needs. I want to be there for her emotionally. I want to be present. I want to be there. I want to communicate with her. I just want to meet her needs. And I just want to, I want to be the guy to meet the needs in her life. I don't want some other guy to come along and meet her needs. I want to meet her needs. And you get two people like that that are like, I, I want to meet them. I love my spouse. I want to meet their need. Then you have the basis of a healthy relationship, a gratifying relationship. You see, we love others, therefore we're giving and generous. These first two points go, go along so well together. Hey, famous verse, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Yeah, He loved and gave. God loved, He gave. We love, we give. That, that's the way it is. God loved, He gave. Jesus loved, He gave. He gave. That's what it's about. Instead of being covetous, we're generous. We're giving. Then let's go to the next couple here. Let's go to verse number two again, and let's cover a couple more. All right? So men shall be lovers of their own selves. So instead of doing that, we're going to follow Jesus' advice and love the Lord and love people. Number two, he said they're covetous. But instead of doing that, we're going to learn to be giving and generous. Then number three, he said people are going to be boasters and proud. Boy, those go together. In fact, there's three that go together. Look down at verse number four. And about in the middle of verse four, you'll see the word <coughs> uh, high-minded. All three of those are the same idea. Proud, boasters, high-minded. If you look up the word bro boasters, it says braggart. Ever meet somebody who's a braggart? When it says proud, you look it up and it says appearing above others, haughty. Ever met someone who's haughty? <laughs> Ever heard the expression, boy, she's always got her nose in the air? That's proud. And then the word high-minded, it means lifted up with pride, inflated with self-esteem, self-conceit. 
I think that guys probably innately struggle with this more than ladies as a rule. Thank you, ladies, for not saying amen right there. <laughs> guys are known for having egos. <laughs> Guys love to brag. I think we come out of the womb. It's like, I can cry louder than you. <laughs> In the nursery, right? The guys are competing. You know, little baby boys, how, who can cry the loudest, I think. You know, I hate to talk about my own kind, you know, because I'm one of them. And I, you know, struggle too. But we can be so stupid, guys. We, we, think, we think, well, you know what? If I, if I look like a, a hunk... My little grandson, he has that green thing called the Incredible Hulk. And I, he's four years old. I'll say, Landon, have you been playing with the Incredible Hunk? And he'll say, Papa, you know you're saying that wrong. <laughs> it's Incredible Hulk. Oh, that's right. I always forget that. I'll tell him. But we think if we can look like the Incredible Hunk, <sighs> and if we brag on ourselves a lot, she's really going to go for me. <sighs> When the truth is, she just wants a guy who will be loving and kind and actually be concerned and interested in her. Ladies, you can say amen. amen. <laughs> you know, a guy who will actually, you know, let her talk and be interested in what she thinks. And, here, and here's the mistake, guys, that we make. And we're guilty, guys. Again, we tend to be this way. And ladies can do this too. But guys, we think... We think that if we, we, we always think the answer to relational problems are outward. If we can just change the outward, whatever it may be, there could be different ways we want to do that, but if we can change the outward, it'll fix our relationship issues. If I could just trim down, get fit, and look better, I'll be irresistible and she'll just want me all the time. <laughs> we think that's going to fix the problem. If I could just make more money, if I could just become more successful, she'll realize what a great catch I am and she'll be a better wife. If I could just move out of this neighborhood and move to a different neighborhood, and, you know, then that'll be the answer. Or you know, if I could just get my kids you know, in a Christian school, that'll fix them. If I could just get them in a different school, that'll fix them. We're always looking for something outward to fix relational problems. When the answer to our relational problems lies right here. It lies in our heart. That's the, the answer is right here. Every day we have to put on the most important piece of clothing that you have. You say, what's that? Look in your handout. I'll show you. 1 Peter 5.5. 5. He says, and be clothed with what? Humility. Humility. For God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Hmm. So every day, he says, clothe yourself in humility. We humble ourselves. God resists the proud, so when we're full of pride, God's not filling our hearts. And I would say this, God, I don't think it's just God that resists the proud. I think pretty much everybody else does too. What do you think? I've heard this expression, pride is a strange disease. It makes everyone sick except the one who has it. Now, the one who has it sick, too. He just doesn't know it, right? But it's so true. In your handout, it says that pride kills relationships. Pride kills relationships. Proverbs 13, 10 in your handout. Look at it with me. It says, only by pride comes contention. Can you say that with me? Let's read it together. Ready? Only by pride comes contention. Think about this. We got this list of destructive things. Pride makes the list three times. So it must be a key issue. 
I mean, Paul finds a way to say pride three different ways on the list. Proud, boasters, high-minded. He finds three different ways to nail pride. And, and, it, and it is a key issue. What's the opposite of pride? Humility. And in your handout, I want you to write that in. Humility heals and keeps healthy our relationships. So, you know, you may be here today and you may be like, you know, I've been, I've been prideful in my relationship with maybe my parents or my kids or my spouse or a sibling, sibling rivalries, right? It could be you've been prideful at work. It could be you've been very prideful. You've been full of pride um, with a relationship with a friend and it's hurt the friendship. It could be you've been prideful um, with someone maybe in a relationship at church. And my advice to you is this, humble yourself, be clothed with humility, go to that person that you've been prideful with and say, hey, I want you to know that I've been wrong in some ways and I've been prideful. I don't want to be that way, but I have been that way. And I'm not perfect. And I have had pride. And I'm sorry. And humble yourself. Try to go build a bridge. Just, just try. You can't make people reconcile. You can't, but, but you can humble yourself. You control that. And try to build a bridge to that other person. It could be a spouse, and you guys are on the outs. Your relationship stinks. Well, is there pride there somewhere? You know, humble yourself. Say, hey, I haven't been doing right, and it's been pride, and I want to get that right. And I have, I'm not perfect, and I'm wrong, I've been wrong, but I, I don't want to be that way, you know? And just, just be real, be, be, be truthful, be honest, and just try to humble yourself. Humility heals relationships. It keeps them healthy. Pride will continue to keep you apart. Does that make sense? Amen? Paul said in the last days, our culture, our homes, and yes, our churches will be full of people, he said, who love themselves are greedy, and are prideful. But if you know Jesus, it doesn't have to be this way. That doesn't have to be the portrait of you. When people look at you, the portrait doesn't have to be, well, he's in love with himself, and he's greedy, and she's prideful. No, it doesn't, that doesn't have to be your portrait. If Christ lives within us, then we have the ability to put Christ on every day and have happy homes and healthy relationships. Can I hear an amen, huh? Amen. We can, hey, what's the three things we learned today? Hey, instead of loving myself, I love God, I love people. Instead of being covetous, I'm very giving and generous. And instead of being boasters and proud and high-minded, I am clothed in humility. And by the way, when you do those three things, do you know what the portrait becomes of you? Guess who you look like? Yeah, people see Jesus in you. That's the portrait. They see Christ in you. Let's pray right now.